I mean, I, I hate to talk about COVID at length, but you know, we have seen some data start to come in on the effects to marketing um, channels and and sales channels that uh, evaporated when when businesses closed. Uh, certainly, industry has largely pivoted towards uh, trying to become more significant in online environments, whether that be uh, through third-party marketplaces that uh, are. are trying to sell your brand or through the development of uh, your own commerce uh, solutions as, as we've, we've done as well. Um, you know, I hate to say we're in all of the above when it comes to marketing, but we have pivoted more to investing in, in SEO strategy. Uh, we publish an enormous amount of content to uh, our website uh, because we know that the recipe with, uh, with Google is, is that uh, for them to rank you, they need to consider you to be a trusted resource, one, one that other companies connect to, uh, as well as having a, a, a library of information that uh, also ties into the way that the algorithm picks up uh, meta words and, 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 and keywords that are in your content as well. So I, I would say our greatest investment really has been in SEO. Um, and we will look at campaign uh, focused um, marketing techniques through, you know, the, the sort of social platforms, whether it be uh, Instagram or, 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 or Twitter um, and, and Facebook as well, of course. But uh, I, I, I've also seen brands in the past waste enormous amounts of money on, on customer acquisition uh, through advertising techniques that once the budget disappears for them, uh, as does the traffic. So uh, organic growth in, in, in uh, commerce uh, sites that you control is absolutely the best investment that you can make. Um, and you, you, you maybe add to that with specific campaign investments that will uh, clearly acquire an audience that, that maybe isn't searching for you. I'd agree in terms of that, you know, the idea of retention or the, the cost per acquisition and seeing the lifetime value of um, a customer. It might be the cheapest thing to, we've seen it with D2C, D2C companies where it was so cheap for a couple of years there with Facebook and Google that you had this huge boom. Uh, but now there's this, you know, customer acquisition cost is so high uh, generally, and then obviously CBD is a whole other mess with Facebook and Google. But yeah, you might, you may well spend a lot of money getting people onto your website and potentially purchasing once, but they might not be the sort of quality, or they might not have the same lifetime value as um, an organic, uh, an organic sale that you know tells five of their friends because they found you through SEO because they were finding, you know, they were typing something genuinely interested that you guys were writing. So yeah, I, I definitely. Uh, agree with that i guess the in terms of traditional versus all of the others it should technically if you have the resource be a science lab and you try and do everything and you try and you try and see and you try and get as much tracking as possible to see what is bringing you not just um acquisition but that lifetime value after you know whether it's three months six months of people actually purchasing again um because it yeah it could be the you know gifting influences um, versus a giant media partnership is so much more effective or that SEO paying someone to do some really cool SEO and CRM, you know, email newsletters gets you so many more sales than uh, billboard advertising, whatever it might be. So I, I would say, try and do as many things as you can and, uh, and yeah, become a kind of science lab to see what works. Creativity goes a long way here. And um, I'll give one example. There are so many ways to get creative, but um, one company here in the United States, this was a THC product, but the, the lesson travels to, to the CBD side. Uh, they got their product put in the bags given out at the Oscars, meaning the Academy Awards. Uh, and the, the press mileage out of that was just, you can imagine, fabulous. Uh, and uh, there was a, it was a long tail on that. And it was their cheapest marketing <laughs> that they had ever done. Uh, the, so uh, it, obviously, that's that's one example. There are other examples, but can you get creative? And that was just a, uh, a that was that was a, a testament to the persistence of the of the folks involved. 
uh, just basically getting, finding a way to get in touch with them saying, do you want this product in your bag? And of course it wasn't THC itself. It was, it was a product that spoke to their product. Um, and, and, uh, that, that's, that's always a, a great move if you can get creative in that way. Sure. Well, pardon me uh, for having a U.S. perspective and, and leaning on it, but I, I do feel that there are lessons to be learned here in, in the U.S. and Canada. We've done uh, a, a few things quite right, and uh, we're out in front in some ways, but we've done a lot of things wrong, and, and there are a lot of lessons to be learned here. One thing that still confuses me, baffles me, excites me, uh, is the lack of focus on regulatory compliance and, and the inability of the industry as a whole. I'm talking about this whole plant industry to think a year and three and five years ahead in terms of compliance and the benefits of that. So I, I will give an example in the US because I think the lesson does travel across the pond. Uh, last July, excuse me, this is uh, July of 2018. Uh, this is a phenomenal statistic and, and uh, this, this is correct. 90% of the licensed products came off the shelves of licensed dispensaries in the state of California, 90%. Why did that happen? Because the regs landed on July, June 30th of 2018. What makes that a, a bona fide phenomenon is the fact that anybody with a brain who thought about it the previous October knew that that was going to happen. It was obvious, it was announced, and it still happened. <laughs> and, and that was, in that sense, uh, that, that, that's played out, that's playing out again here um, at the national level with the FDA. The FDA is going to regulate everything in sight as relates to CBD and other aspects of this plant. Uh, and there are pathways to travel to become compliant now with the, with the regulations that will land tomorrow. Uh, and that's true in, in Europe as well. It's true in the UK, it's true in England. And so I, I think that the, the big, great big lesson here is you can look at compliance as a cost and it's really nothing to focus on in the short term because it's just about getting revenues in the door to, to outweigh your expenses. Um, but it does, uh, I, I think that that's uh, a short-sighted view and, and I do encourage anyone who'll listen to really look at compliance as, as not so much a cost as an investment in future market share because that's precisely what it is. You have sovereign governments that are essentially, I think, in practical terms, offering to partner with you to eliminate your competition. And the only thing that you need to do to accept that offer of your sovereign government to eliminate your competition is to start complying today with the regulations that will exist tomorrow, because that's exactly what will happen. So I, I would say that that's the biggest lesson here is compliance doesn't have to be merely a cost. It can be an, it can be an investment in future market share. And it really does, I think, play out that way here in the U.S. and in Canada. And I think it'll play that way uh, in the rest of the world as well. I couldn't agree more. Uh, we do look at, at, at regulation as a clear opportunity. Um, it's obvious in the, in, in the U.K. that the Novel Foods um, Act will come in. Uh, to play before regulation on other product categories will be complete. Um, and there's you know, a, a broadly uh, considered opinion that uh, more than half of the current uh, brands that exist in, in, in the marketplace will disappear because the compliance path is either too complicated for them to understand, uh, too expensive for them to invest in, um, or it's just uh, it, it's going to require a scale of, of their business, which they're not, uh, they're not currently at. Um, you know, this really is the sort of transition from the kitchen cook to, uh, you, know, a, 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 you know, companies that are large enough to scale their operations to absorb the costs of, of, of regulation. Uh, but I think all brands that, that, that want to exist um, beyond a, a year or two from now, if this investment's not being made right now, even in knowledge acquisition of where the regulations are likely going, uh, that, that those brands will be struggling, um, you know, before too long. And, and, and in Europe, it's, it's even more complicated because every country here is, is rolling out different requirements. And, you know, our company is, is using a distillate as its base ingredient, which of course is a mixture of many cannabinoids. Uh, some are offside in some countries, some are not. Uh, and, and it's not just understanding uh, your own marketplace and, and what compliance means to you, but whatever country you have aspirations to sell in, you, you have to be certain that what you've developed is going to be compliant in a broader sense as well, or that you've got a country specific strategy that's going to allow you to be uh, uh, compliant long term there as well. I think it's also really important for the consumer. So I completely agree with what's been said. I think the regulation actually provides an enormous 
opportunity for the brands who are in it for the long term. Um, it's also really important for the consumer to be able to um, fully engage with the space, knowing that the brands that remain are super high quality. I think I said it before, the UK consumer is a little bit prickly. They know, um, you know, BS when they can see it. And if you are a brand trying to peddle some sort of claim or some sort of incredible effectiveness of your product, which is just, you know, physically impossible or um, unrealistic, um, the UK consumer is quite... Um, dry in their humor and they're quite perceptive. And I think the uh, compliance component is really important, especially as we hope to continue to have products in the likes of the top retailers in the UK. We have to um, take the financial hit or investment, you know, to support the category as a whole, because the reason that these products have been created, why Trip was created is so that other people could benefit from uh, this plant that we didn't know existed. And we, we personally as founders didn't actually have any experience with before. So it's super short-sighted to um, assume that, you know, the, the problematic brands will be exiting the space anyway, shall we say. Um, and those that are in it for the long haul are obviously investing in building the category. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and on that note, uh, Olivia, we've uh, seen things happen here in the States. I, I think the folks that, that were affected would have benefited from that <clears throat> insight. Uh, so to be more particular here, when regulatory bodies do start to enforce, at least uh, here in the Americas, they've been picking off the people that have making, been making the boldest claims, uh, the mm -hmm. medical claims. Mm -hmm. and, and the interesting thing there again is like, okay, you're asking for it, you're gonna get it. Mm -hmm. and, and folks who think about it know that, then sure enough, they end up getting the letters from the FDA. Uh, and and that's, that's going to play out in Europe as well. You're gonna have some folks that are just really going to get aggressive with their marketing and they're going to get hit first. Uh, because there's a capacity issue um, everywhere, at least when, when they start, first start to look at this subject matter and start to get their hands on it. I'm talking about the regulatory authorities of, of respective sovereign territories, and they, they pick off the, the best examples first. Uh, so I, I would caution folks to exercise restraint in their claims um, so that you can uh, sort of not be the first guy speeding down the road that the cop picks off. Thank you.